need, how, how they come together. Yeah. I, think, I think that's why you know, this conversation will be more fruitful because that's the question that we posed with regards to the universe. And as an engineer, you know, anytime you see a piece of machinery or you see something, you've never said when you look at maybe something complex, like a microwave, you'd never say that if this was left over millions and billions of years, it would just come by itself. So would I be, uh, tell me if there's another option. I say when it comes to what we see around us, we can conclude either it made itself, either it came from nothing, or either it was created. So are there any other options that maybe I've missed out or I'm trying to lead you somewhere? Yeah? Out of these, because you said Simon, yeah? So Simon, logically, let's, let's stick with logic. Sometimes people say, oh, what if I'm in the matrix? What if I'm in a dream? What if I'm here? What if I'm there? What if I'm here? What if I'm there? So we'll just, we'll just stick with just logic. What answer makes the most logical and common sense, yeah? So out of these three, to you, Simon, what makes the most sense to you? Uh, to me, I'm atheist. I don't believe in evolution or anything. Oh, sorry, I believe in evolution rather than uh, divine creation. Um, but bear in mind, evolution talks about organisms, isn't it? It doesn't talk about how matter and how organic and inorganic matter came into being. O o evolution only deals um, with, of course, life forms evolving, change over time, mutation, etc., etc. So we're we're talking about the origin, the beginning. The origin of the first organic. Yeah, no, just just the beginning of everything that you see around you. Do you think when you see everything, do you think that it created itself? Like like a rock. You're not going to say a rock evolved, isn't it? You're not going to yeah. say mountains or seas or stuff like that evolved. So would you say it created itself, came from nothing? Or it makes sense that something as complex as what we see and you as an engineer, that it makes logical sense that there could be a creator. I'm not saying there is, could be. The potential's there, I would say that there's as much evidence for that as there is for any other explanation, but I would say that there's, from my point of view, very little evidence of any explanation at all. But more so for it being created, is that what you said? I'm saying there's equally little evidence for all explanations. Okay, interesting. But, I, but when we say that the universe created itself, logically that doesn't technically make sense. I wouldn't put them on, on an equal footing. Reason being the universe creating itself it's known as the cosmic bootstrap. It's like trying to pick yourself, yourself up using your shoelaces. Yeah. You see? So there's a logical contradiction in that sense, but also in the sense that uh, the universe, the universe created itself presupposes that there's a universe to begin with. You see? Yes. Yeah, I know. Um, I would say that... Yeah. So, You'd probably say that's a bit less than the others, yeah? No, I would say that it has more evidence up until the point of the Big Bang and then before that there's, there's a point of singularity, so there's absolutely no data. Time didn't exist. It is literally the beginning of creation, so... Uh, there is no evidence for anything before that because there was nothing to have evidence of. But the thing, Simon, is when you say evidence, what are we regarding as evidence then? Any record whatsoever. Am I correct to assume that you mean empirical evidence? Uh, is that what you regard as evidence in this conversation? Anything at all, any records, any... Uh, yeah, I guess it's Empirical. Yeah. But would you also accept how even science doesn't rely solely on empirical evidence? It will rely on other forms of evidence. Yeah, yeah. That's so when, say this. Each one is, is equally little evidence to support that. Whether it's, you know, the Big Bang Theory, there's a uh, large amount of scientific guesswork or whatever. So I think there's equally little evidence to support that as opposed to divine creation or whatever. So I'll, I'll posit to you 
that out of the three options, and you can challenge me again, when, when we look at what's around us during, from our understanding, rationally, logically, something creating itself doesn't rationally make sense. It's just like, like I mentioned, something lifting itself or um, like a, a mother giving birth to herself. There has to be her mother and father that then, you know, they copulated, then the mother became pregnant and then slowly, you know, keep going forward. That's really loud. Uh, Abdul Karim, uh, let's move, it's too loud. It's too loud. Yeah, yeah. Should we just move ahead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll probably, I'll probably have... Uh, you know, it would look cooler if I lined them all here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing is that if I do that, I think they interfere with each other yeah, and it just, messes, it just messes stuff up. So, Simon, I guess what I'm saying is that generally speaking, when, for example, we get up in the morning, there's, there's certain rationalities and logics. For example, you have to, for you to even get up in the morning and come to Speaker's Corner, you have to acknowledge and appreciate that there has to be a degree of uniformity, regularity and stability in nature for us to even do science, for us to even go to work, come back from work and for us to live a non-anxious existence in the sense that oh, Simon is walking down the street, you know, a tree flew and turned into Queen Elizabeth. People started questioning, what's the Queen doing? Then Simon turned into the Loch Ness Monster. People said, yo, we found the Loch Ness Monster. And then suddenly Trump appeared out of nowhere, as if from a poker ball. Yeah. So it's, it's ludicrous, it's ridiculous. But Simon, with all due respect, what I've noticed in the park is, sometimes I'll have discussion with a lot of people that will claim to be rational, but the thing is, they, the rationale, I'm not saying this is you, but when it comes to everybody else, or everything else, they'll say, you know what, you can't, I, I wouldn't agree or accept in my daily life things will just randomly pop into existence and pop out of existence yeah. because that would lead to life becoming an absurdity yeah. Yeah? or uh, things, uh, mothers giving birth to themselves without the father the, there's been outrage, the father is furious reported by CNN yeah. Yeah? we don't hear any of that but when it comes to religion we're so liberal with a small L we're like, hey, you know what? Maybe I'm dreaming, maybe you're dreaming, maybe we're both collectively dreaming. Maybe I'm an egg, maybe you're, you know, this or maybe that. So uh, what I think is, I think when it comes to rationality, I think people withhold that when it comes to religion. That's why, and, and you're not going to be pinned down to anything. I just wanted to show you that if you follow the logical progression, even you will see that, you know what, logically, this did not come from nothing. Yeah logically did not create itself it needed an entity now we an entity as did philosophers in the past like Leibniz and Aristotle and you know, Ibn Sina and these individuals or somebody might say you know what I have an issue with what the religious adherents do not per se with religion itself do you see because sometimes it's the emotion that clouds the rationality and people will will accept a multiverse but they won't be able to accept the universe. Yeah. They'll multiply the problem, but they won't deal with the initial problem at hand. Do you see? Yeah. So, do you see where I'm coming from, yeah? So, rationally speaking, we can acknowledge that there has to be, that out of the three options, the creator option makes the most sense. Even if I now go to another track and I say, let's go philosophically. There's three types of existence, yeah? Even if you are the biggest skeptic, you would say dependency, independency and non-existence. I'm presupposing that if you're such a skeptic that you're saying the only thing that I accept that exists um, is, is existence. Yeah, there is existence. Yeah. You accept there's existence, yeah. isn't it? Then would you say that there is dependent existence, independent existence, a dependent existence, independent existence and impossible existence? Yeah, I guess so. When you say existence, do you mean existence of us? Yeah, consciousness or yeah, whatever we see around us. Sure. So, would you agree also... Sorry, were you going to say something? No, no. That's okay. That's would, you, would you also agree and accept that we and what you see around you 
is a form of dependency, dependent existence. That we're all dependent on something. Dependent on something being created or just dependent? Just dependent. Yeah. Uh, we would be dependent on oxygen, a uh, toaster is dependent on electricity and yeah. this and that. Gravity, Yeah, exactly. So now, here's the, here's the logical conundrum I want to pose. Okay. Yeah? Do you think that we can have an infinite regress of dependent things? What do you mean by infinite regress? I'll posit this as like an analogy. If I am to throw one of these microphones, because there's just so many of them, yeah? yeah. So let's say I want to throw one of them. Yeah. But before I am to throw one of them, I have to ask his permission. Yeah. He has to ask somebody else's permission, he has to ask someone else's permission, he has to ask... And it goes on ad infinitum. Would I ever get to throw the microphone? No. So logically, there has to be an end to that chain, yeah. which philosophically we call the necessary being. Yeah, not God yet. We're just saying that this is the argument contingent, nece uh, necessary, and impossible. I used the terms interchangeably of dependency and independency. Okay. Yeah, but the technical term is contingency, contingency, and uh, necessity, yeah, necessary existence. So there has to be a necessary being at the end of that chain. Otherwise, we wouldn't necessarily exist. Yeah. Do you see? Just like I wouldn't be able to throw the microphone, we wouldn't exist if it was an ab, uh, ad infinitum of dependencies. With me so far, yeah? Okay, great. So this default position of accepting that there has to be an end to that chain, which is the necessary being, most philosophers haven't had an issue with. They're called deists. Yeah? Now the next step is that how do you now say that that necessary being is God? Which now you're wondering as well, like how is he going to jump from necessary being to God? Yeah? yeah. Okay, so let me just give you the criteria of, as Muslims, our criteria of God. Say he is God the one. This is in chapter 111. Yeah? So, or chapter 112, Surah Ikhlas. Say he is God the one. Independent, he does not beget nor is he begotten, and there's none like him. That's our definition of a God. We don't believe that he is an old man with a beard, with a staff. We don't believe that he has a son that he sends down, you know, that dies. We don't believe that he's a blue individual with four arms and daggers. We don't accept or entertain that uh, at all. Why? Because philosophically, rationally, in, in terms of inference to the best explanation, there has to be an end to that chain. The end to that chain has to be a necessary being, number one. Now, logically, that necessary being is independent because that, the end to that chain. They have to have a will, because if they don't have a will, then they're contingent. They're not the end to that chain. They're a part of that chain. They have to have an immense amount of power because power by definition, you. Uh, if we say something or someone has power, power by definition you get from something else. You can't just get power. Yeah. yeah? So these are, and then when we look at intelligence, because there's intelligence and you know, complexity that logically infers that the necessary being also has intelligence. So that, in a nutshell, is our definition, the Muslim definition of a god. How does that sound? Logically and rationally to you, Much from how I would tell. The dependence thing. You're yeah. talking about dependence on, for my existence, it's dependent on yes. my parents' existence, which is dependent on their grandparents' That's right. Existence. Or even in terms of oxygen, uh, in terms of food, nutrients. Yeah. All of these things are dependencies. Yeah. And so when you say the base of all that dependency is uh, the, the being. Uh, the necessary being, the necessary yeah. being isn't it? Because that being doesn't have to be a being as such but a, a set of laws like gravitational attraction is a law and it dictates that everything that happens within our universe and there's entropy is a law everything everything becomes less ordered over time right in general nothing ever becomes more ordered interesting uh, so a set of laws that define those dependencies so everything relates back to those laws which essentially defines the universe and it doesn't explain sort of the dependencies of what came first anymore. Uh, it, 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 yeah, it doesn't explain that part of your argument. It, it loses out there. But how would you uh, 
yeah, refute that in terms of, um, yeah, your, your, your beliefs. So you think forces, yeah? Yeah, in terms in of a nutshell. Um, fundamental laws kind of thing. Fundamental laws, right. How does that, uh, how does that, is that something that is at odds with your beliefs? Um, Not necessarily. Uh, those, would you say that those laws are, are below your uh, necessary being or, or how, would, how, how, how does that fit in with your... Yeah, or my point, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when it comes to forces, forces are descriptive and prescriptive. They're not creative. Yeah. Forces don't create anything. Um, this was an argument posed by Stephen Hawking where he said the beginning of everything, you know, it came from gravity. Gravity is the beginning of everything. But that doesn't necessarily make sense because gravity doesn't do anything. Gravity is a law that we use to describe and, and, and prescribe things. Yeah. yeah? For example, um, the law of arithmetic that will never create money in my bank believe me I've tried <laughs> uh, it rather explains it yeah. me working and doing something that's the only thing that will put money in my bank not the law itself uh, for example the law of motion which you probably studied in engineering you know there's someone playing snooker pool or billiards the law of motion is not something that moves um, that's what explains the ball moving but it doesn't cause the ball to move. The cause of the ball to move is the individual hitting okay. the cue. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Would you say that? Uh, would you say that if the necessary being had its action at the start and then did nothing else for the rest of the time, would that explain? Uh, would that be something that makes sense, or like would that fit into your worldview, or is that? Do you think it's having a continuous effect? Yeah. So <laughs> one of the criteria that we have for the necessary being, the characteristics, we believe that the necessary being is intelligent and from intelligence comes wisdom. So I talked about intelligence. I said because of the complexity and everything that we see around us. But that also, um, I, I think wisdom is logical as well. Uh, that the necessary being is, is wise. Now, if we accept the necessary being to be wise, it's not wise to create something complex and entire systems and forces and everything and just leave it yeah, with no purpose and just yeah. let it waft in space like a cloud of smoke. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah? yeah? So that's our kind of uh, perspective um, for, from a Muslim. Because, and the reason why I wanted to kind of clarify our definition of God, because normally, Simon, you said, yeah? Normally, Simon, people don't necessarily have an issue with a supreme being or a supreme power, but it's how people interpret it. Like they say, oh, no, he has a son, or that the sun came down, but then there's the eternal sin, or, or, or there's this God, the God of the sea, and this and that. That is something that causes issues. That's why I wanted to break it down into like um, the, the fundamentals. That we accept now from there simon uh, is there anything else that you say maybe touch more upon this or that before i move on no. okay so then a, a sign of wisdom i was looking into this as well how would you say is the best form of learning as as human beings what's the best instrument that we have and the most effective instrument that we have to to learn other than, of course, the faculties that we have, or to, to disseminate knowledge. Uh, so you're asking what the best format of the best, is? Yeah, the best medium of disseminating knowledge. Uh, I guess practical experience, doing something for yourself. Would okay. That's what I'm waiting for. I would add one thing on top of that. Let's just say, if as a school teacher, because I used to be a school teacher, if I am teaching something, to a bunch of kids um, and let's just say half the class is in. Yeah. If I have to maybe every other day go over the same thing again and again and again and again, I'd be exhausted. So I would come up with like a bunch of worksheets as a school teacher. Yeah. But something more effective, and this is, you're probably familiar with this in your engineering course, and this costs us a lot of money, which is to buy the texts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah? <laughs> You know, and I looked at you, I could see the pain in your eyes because I remember when I had to get the books, 
It was so expensive and some of the books I didn't even end up reading. Yeah. So that, that was the, the, the sad reality, unfortunately. Yeah. So going on with this, that God is all wise, He's intelligent. And an intelligent being creating something with a purpose wants to disseminate, wants to pass on wisdom, knowledge. And the best way that I have come across is combination of oral and written. Because when it comes to written, it can be changed. As I'm going to posit, and I don't think any Christian has an issue with this, the, the Bible has many versions. But the Quran has one version. Yeah, There's no multiple versions because it's coupled with the written word and the oral tra uh, tradition, which is mo uh, there's a significant amount of Muslims as young as six it's within our tradition to memorize the Quran from beginning to end. To such a degree that if every single holy book was burnt today, for some reason, the Quran would be the only one that would be written down word for word. That, that's quite interesting, isn't it? And what's interesting also is the Quran is written in a language that's accessible to people. It's written in Arabic. And Arabic is the top five most spoken languages in the world. If you look at the Old Testament, that's written in Hebrew. Hebrew is not widely spoken. The New Testament um, is based on Jesus. Jesus spoke Aramaic. Aramaic is not a live language. Um, the Vedas are written in Sanskrit. Sanskrit is not a live language. So if somebody claims that this is a book that's for humanity, for us to follow, even in these times, then it has to be something that's accessible, even objectively as well. And the Quran has manuscripts dated to the time of compilation, which none of the ancient religions claim. The Vedas don't claim that, the Old Testament and New Testament don't claim that as well. So if I'm saying and I'm making the claim that the Quran is the book till the Day of Judgment, yeah, for us to benefit from, and this holds the words of God, then surely God should be able to preserve it. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be one of your criteria for a holy book? Yeah, it makes sense, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I ask, but I feel that we're on the same page, but feel free to just jump in and go, mm, I wouldn't, I have a bit of an issue with that. If I'm going too fast, tell me to slow down a little bit, yeah? So the holy book, somebody says, if you don't follow this holy book, the hellfire for you, I say, okay, how many versions is it? Yeah. There's five different versions. How, how does that work out? It's from God. Yes, it's from God. Which version? Yeah. I'm going to say my version. But with the Quran, even when you've got different sects, the sects still accept the Quran. Yeah, same book. Yeah, it's the same book. And there's only one, unchanged. Yeah, so that as a criteria, that even a form of disseminating knowledge or passing on a message, I would argue that the, the written word, and, and I was pondering on this as well, it makes the most sense, Simon, because let's just say we're having a nice conversation. Reason why there's like seven different cameras here because there are people at home that are going to be watching this, this conversation and benefiting from it. So now we've got that, but that relies on YouTube. <laughs> and just like um, there used to be, I think, MySpace that shut down. Vine, Vines, there used to be a, a website with Vines that shut down. So that's the thing with online, it can be changed. But with the written word, Generally speaking, what you write down, you can kind of carbon date the ink, you can carbon date the manuscripts and the stuff like that as well. So there's a degree of accountability. And now with deep fake, when it comes to online stuff, that's why, do you see, it's not as reliable as people may, may say. Um, and fake news, you know, people say, oh no, that's fake news, I didn't say this or that. So the written word is something which is consistent amongst the religions. For a holy book, Simon, what would you say would also be criteria that's needed for you to say, you know what, for me to say that this is from God, here's the criteria that also needs to follow. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm not a religious guy, so... No, I just, just you. Outside. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't say, to be honest. Okay, so preservation, of course. Tell me if you agree with...